coming up on the premiere of Women of the World. Who are these women of intrigue? An American who joined the Society of the Japanese Geisha. A chance meeting and a German woman becomes a Nazi hunter. They're searching for the past, breaking new ground in ancient Egypt. The enigma that is Yoko Ono, her life after John. And the provocative Sonia Braga, now an international star. Join host Jacqueline Bissett for the premiere of Women of the World, next. Women of the World, brought to you in part by the Olay family of skincare products. famous British philosopher, John Stuart Mill, once said, the knowledge we have of women will always be superficial until women themselves have told all they have to tell. This is Women of the World, an international series of seven one-hour specials devoted to women, who we are and what we've accomplished. Camera crews have traveled to over 18 countries in search of women of all nationalities and all walks of life. Women of the World is the first time a major television series has set out to present a living portrait of women. Women who dare, women who challenge, women who have had tremendous courage, yet who have never lost their great gifts to give life, to nurture, to love. Tonight, we focus on women of intrigue. They are leaders, strong, powerful, wise, and passionate. Links in a long line of women who have left their stamp on history. They are women of style, with an aura of mystery, who set the standards of their age for elegance and grace. Artists, women of talent and character, they have enriched the world with their gifts. Some have given too much. They are women of great beauty who capture us with their joy and passion for life. Women who make us laugh. And women who are the very essence of intrigue, who will always remain a mystery. They are women who have pushed back the frontiers of knowledge. Some have traveled into the unknown and paid the ultimate price. They are courageous women who give freely of themselves. Their compassion and heart have made the world a better place for us all. Stay with us as we enter the private world of the Geisha. Eleven years ago, a young American woman traveled to Japan seeking to understand the world of the geisha. After many months, her okasan, her geisha mother, told her that the only way she could ever learn the mistress of the geisha was to become one herself. Liza Dolby accepted the challenge. She became a geisha and was renamed Ichigiku. Her insights into these mysterious women who live in the world of the flower and the willow are a rare glimpse into a private society that grew and flourished through the centuries in male-dominated Japan. Kyoto, the historical capital of Japan. 
Its temples and its streets served the samurai and the shogun. It is the center, the heart of Japanese culture. It is also the home of the geisha, the ancient society of women who inhabit what the Japanese call the world of the flower and the willow. This is an important day for the geisha of Kyoto. A critical audience judges them as they display the skills in classical dancing and singing it has taken them long years to acquire. The world of the geisha is mysterious and easily misunderstood. But Liza Dalby, an American anthropologist, knows it well. In 1974, she lived as a geisha for a year. She was the first non-Japanese ever to join their ranks. Today, Liza and her okasan, the woman who trained her, pay respect to Liza's friend and geisha sister, Ishiume, who died 10 years ago. It was they who transformed a 24-year-old Californian into a geisha. Liza's experiences as a geisha have recently been turned into a CBS movie starring Pam Dauber. Liza submitted herself to the strict discipline of geisha training. Because she speaks fluent Japanese, she could see firsthand what geisha are and what they are not. And I would say that 90% of Americans or Europeans who hear the word geisha would say, oh yes, that's, that's an old-fashioned Japanese prostitute, high-class Japanese prostitute. And then there will be that 10% who's had some connection with Japan who say, no, that's totally untrue, completely misleading. A geisha is an artist. But geisha certainly are not prudes either. Polishing themselves as works of art uh, absolutely involves the, the sensual. It is the artistic side of this life that attracts 18-year-old Ichiku. She is a maiko, a geisha in training. In three years, she will be polished and become a full geisha. Then she will join the 200 geisha in Kyoto, the elite of Japan. When night falls and the signs of the tea houses beckon customers, the real work of the geisha begins. Ichiku is preparing for tonight's banquet. As a maiko, she must wear makeup. It is only geisha who are allowed to go without. <laughs> Tonight's customers wait expectantly for their geisha hostesses to appear. The geisha and Maiko arrive at the tea house, where they have been hired to entertain. The men will pay $1,500 for something they don't get at home. The kind of Social entertaining, for example, that in America is absolutely part of a wife's role, is just not uh, considered appropriate or necessary for a Japanese uh, housewife. It's almost like there's a division of labor, sort of a feminine division of labor in Japan, whereas in Western society we, in a sense, you could say, almost have this impossible ideal that, that combines it all. <laughs> The kind of risque jokes that men can, um, can do with, with geisha is something that they don't do with their wives. When a geisha reaches her usually mid to late 20s, um, all of them hope to have a patron. And this is a very, usually a very long-lasting relationship, a very close relationship. From the geisha's point of view, she finds a patron. From society's point of view, she becomes a man's mistress. While it's not the same thing as prostitution, it's not the um, sort of the thing that uh, you know nice middle class girls aspire to. You proudly present an evening of geisha entertainment to the Queen of England or to the American president, but you don't want your daughter to become a geisha. Geisha are keeping alive a 400 year old tradition. They are preserving the Japanese classical arts and at the same time they are paid hostesses. Liza asked Ichiku what kind of future she sees for herself. What are your thoughts for the future? Uh, I want to have a shop. Mm. A shop, an establishment of your own? Yes. Mm. But what about boy, a boyfriend or marriage? Do you think you'd like to be married someday? Mm -hmm. mm. 
<laughs> well, you're still young. Time to think. Mm. This is the future that the majority of Japanese women can look forward to. Married by 25, they are expected to devote themselves to their husbands and family. Geisha are not allowed to marry. If they want children, they can only have them illegitimately. What then are the rewards? Geisha are not dependent on a husband. They control their own lives. They may not have a traditional family, but even in later years they have each other. It is a sisterhood. Liza has returned to Japan to show her old friends the book she wrote about their geisha society. They are happy their story is finally being told to the world. I think the women who become geisha have a certain dramatic sense. I mean, their, their lives are more intense. Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, which is, I suppose, to say that the highs are higher and maybe the lows are lower. I mean, it's the, the waters that geisha sort of navigate are maybe a little rougher. The roughest waters for the geisha may lie ahead. As the relationship between the sexes becomes more equal in modern Japan, fewer and fewer women are choosing to live in the delicate world of the flower and the willow. Next, an avenging angel seeks out Nazi war criminals. The symbol of justice is a woman. Eyes blindfolded, she holds the scales where right and wrong are weighed. At the end of the Second World War, when the full horror of the Holocaust was revealed, it was thought the guilty would be brought to justice. But some of the greatest war criminals of our time managed to escape. For years they lived in comfort, securing the knowledge that their past had been forgotten. But one woman had not forgotten. A solitary woman is returning from another research trip. This woman's life is in danger. She lives in a shadow world where the dangerous, violent men she pursues can strike back at her anywhere, anytime. Her name is Beata Klarsfeld. She is a Nazi hunter. Klaus Barbie, otherwise known as the Butcher of Lyon. Beata Klarsfeld pursued him for 12 years finally tracking him to Bolivia. Because of her, Barbie is now serving a life sentence in a French jail. Beata Klarsfeld's journey from a normal childhood in Germany to a dangerous world of international intrigue is due to a fateful meeting in 1960 with a young Frenchman, Serge Klarsfeld. Beata was working as an au pair girl in Paris. Serge was a law student. They met on a subway platform and fell in love. I was uh, supposed to be here for a year to learn some French uh, in a French language school and uh, be back in Germany and becoming the traditional German housewife and living for the children and uh, the nice apartment. As the young couple walked the streets of Paris together, they spoke about themselves. Beata had grown up in a Protestant home in Berlin. Her father had served in Hitler's army. She knew nothing of the Nazi persecution of the Jews. Serge told his story. He was a Jew. His father had died at Auschwitz. I didn't know in the beginning when we met in the middle that he's Jewish. Uh, and it's only uh, a little later than he told me that he's Jewish. And he also told me how his father was arrested by the Germans and deported and he died in Auschwitz. So, um, for me, it was certainly, um, it was a difficult, I wouldn't say difficult, but it was um, a little embarrassing because uh, being a German and he lost his father in the gas chambers because uh, my people are responsible for this. Both their families argued bitterly against the relationship, but despite their protests, Beata and Serge were married. 
Beata was unaware of what had happened to the Jews at the hands of the Nazis. It was Serge who told her the truth. Then one day, they saw a photograph that changed their lives. They felt the couple in the picture could easily have been them. Beata was haunted by the picture. She felt tainted by the crimes of her father's generation. She was proud of being German. But the Germany she loved was also the Germany of Belsen and Auschwitz. She thought of other trains and other passengers. Who were these men who had sent millions to their deaths? They had locked the doors and lit the ovens, and now they had disappeared. Beata and Serge vowed to pursue them. They discovered evidence proving that the Chancellor of Germany, Kurt Kiesinger, had been a high Nazi officer. Beata confronted him in Parliament and slapped his face. He resigned his position. If I would be Jewish, you could say my father was deported as an act of vengeance, but being German and protesting against the crimes of my own, uh, of the, my own generation, that means uh, I'm protesting against uh, my father, my mother. And, uh, you know, the uh, slap against Kissinger was also a kind of slap given by the daughter to the father, but the father was a Nazi. Armed with meticulous research, Beata and Serge began to track down former Nazis. She staged demonstrations and publicly embarrassed former Nazi officials. She traveled to Bolivia, to Chile and to Paraguay, havens for Nazi criminals, and demanded the guilty be extradited. She was arrested, but she succeeded in making these men face their past. Men like Nazi Colonel Kurt Lischke. Major Herbert Hagen, both implicated in the deaths of thousands of French Jews. And the infamous SS Colonel Walter Rauf, accused of the deaths of 97,000 Jews in mobile gas chambers. The men that Beata and Serge pursue are unrepentant and dangerous. They have buried their past and will do anything to avoid exposure. Sure, the, way, the work we are doing uh, brings us enemies, uh, fortunately also a lot of friends, but enemies too. And uh, so the bomb was put into our car, we received a parcel at home and uh, we received threats, uh, mainly if uh, our name appears in the newspapers. So then we receive threats by phone or by letter. We continue to, to live a normal life because anyway there is no, uh, no way uh, uh, to prevent from being hurt. But um, you know you have to take it easy and you get used to it. Beata and Serge try to lead a normal life. They say it's the simple family things and their children that give them the courage to overcome their fears. Serge says, the death of my father was avenged when I married Beata. She was involved, so I get involved by thanks to her because I never believed that I could do something I would say for for a cause, and uh, so we left a life which was surely a, a normal life without any political problems, and uh, we involved ourselves. Uh, I never believed that I could be uh, so happy. The Klarsfelds have received international recognition for their work. Beata was given France's highest award, the Legion of Honor. I was proposed twice for the Nobel Peace Prize, and I think that's something uh, very it's exciting. It's uh, unbelievable that the German was uh, proposed by the Israelis for the Nobel Peace Prize. Despite these honors, Beata's work is far from over. Her triumph is in proving that one person's actions can make the difference. In the words of her poem, For no one asked the women who were consumed in the gas ovens, and who died in the bombings, and who shrieked under torture, whether they were women. There is a mother who smiles at the smile of her infant, and cannot conceive that he may be murdered, or that he may become a murderer. That is why, impelled by 50 million corpses and by all generations yet to come, 
My hand struck the face of 10 million Nazis, and Germany needed the hand of a woman to deliver it. When we return, we'll meet the star of Kiss of the Spider Woman, Sonia Braga. When Sonia Braga feels the camera on her, she transforms herself into a star. A commanding, sensuous woman whose fame in Brazil is being recognized the world over. Sonia Braga has been praised for her talent and her courageous sexual explicitness. She is a true woman of intrigue. She is mysterious and provocative. A Brazilian film star who has captured the attention of the world in the film Kiss of the Spider Woman. Sonia Braga's performance is sexy and dangerous. But who is the woman behind the role? Where does the Spider Woman end and Sonia Braga begin? Who is Sonia Braga? I mean, in fact, my name, the whole name is Sonia Maria Campos Braga. And uh, I used to say that Sonia Braga is the, that girl, the screen, and um, Maria Campos is the person who works for Sonia Braga. And uh, she is her secretary. And they don't like each other because one is too much a star, and the other ones never do the things the star one to. Sonia Braga is a photographer's dream. She's a classic Latin beauty who loves the camera. And as with most great beauties, the camera loves her. My relation with the camera is much, much better than with the people. I love cameras because they just love me. When I show something to the cameras, they never do that. You know what I mean? It's so hard. Sometimes I come and say, listen, I love you, and this person goes. So cameras, they never do that to me. They are very nice. It's very hard to find a person who is totally open, not just to give, but to accept love. Sonia at age five. She was one of seven children. Born in the town of Moringa, in the interior of Brazil, Sonia recalls her childhood as being poor, but happy and carefree. Until the day tragedy struck. My father died and I was eight years old. And the, my mother, she was like 30s, and she has like seven children. You know, she's tough, and she's um, very strong, but she has one thing that's very good, and I, I learned a lot of, with her, is that uh, she has a good sense of humor. So life wasn't good. We, we didn't have a lot of money, I mean, nothing. And... Uh, but you know, we, we are, we are to now very, very rich people. In the movie, Dona Flor and her two husbands, Sonia marries two men. In her many love scenes, she has seduced men with her passion. But in real life, at age 36, Sonia has never married. I think it's good to be together when you love someone, but I really don't believe in marriage. I like men sometimes when they can show how fragile they are and when they give me the chance to be strong for them. I, I like to be generous. I'm a very generous person. And uh, I don't like the position of the woman to be fragile all the time or the man to be strong all the time. So what I, I like in people is to be what they are and to be strong when they have to or to show something more sensitive when we need it. 
Sonia has been called the Marilyn Monroe of South America. She epitomizes total femininity. She's all woman. But Sonia is also curious about what it is to be macho, to be male. I want to be a man just two seconds, just one second to understand what it's a, to be a man. It's a, so complicated as a woman to think what is to be a man or for a man to understand, for example, what is to be pregnant. It's so difficult to, to um, exchange this position very, very in deep way. So anyhow, I'm uh, very happy. Happy is a woman. Coming up next, nine women's remarkable search for lost Egyptian treasures. In that quest to uncover an ancient civilization, five American women from diverse backgrounds were united by their dream to save and restore precious Egyptian antiquities. They ignored those who said it couldn't be done and went to the Valley of the Kings. There they teamed up with four Egyptologists and began the first female archaeological expedition. They are called the Women of Karnak. Egypt, the land of the pyramids, cradle of civilization, the birthplace of kings and gods. For centuries, its secrets have drawn those who would unlock its ancient mysteries. A four-day journey down the Nile leads to the Valley of the Kings and the Great Temple of the Pharaohs, Karnak. Life here remains unchanged. The unbroken link with the past goes back 4,000 years to the time when the cities of Thebes and Luxor flourished on the banks of the Nile. Karnak was the largest temple in the ancient world. A succession of pharaohs added to its splendor, making it Egypt's national shrine. It draws to its ruins those in search of history, and those who believe that here lies the secret to past lives. Well, we were all drawn to this one site. I think I believe in reincarnation, and I feel that we have all been here many times, not just one time, but many times through Egyptian history. This is my firm belief. This belief united the unlikely members of the world's first all-women archaeological expedition. Mary Martin, an artist and art dealer. Audrey Topping, photojournalist and author. Diane Smith, once a Radio City Music Hall Rockette, today president of a business conglomerate. Beja Carlson, mother of eight and former world champion skeet shooter. And her sister Gypsy Graves, a former horse trainer, today director of an archaeological museum. Two years ago, they teamed up with Dr. Wafa El Sadiq, a respected Egyptologist, and her three assistants, who had all spent ten years working in the field. It was the precedent-setting nature of their two-nation all-women expedition that convinced Egyptian authorities to grant them a choice site at Karnak. Their mission? To find roads, homes and shrines, remnants of the past that will shed new light on how people once lived. The project will take ten years to complete. When we first came out on the site, um, we looked at the site and wondered how big the thing was. We only walked over it once. I went home came back and the site had grown overnight. When we measured it off, it finally worked out to just under 12 acres. They have brought new technology to the dig. Using Gypsy's sophisticated equipment, they probe 20 feet below the surface. And without disturbing the ground, they can detect where structures and artifacts lie buried. There is definitely something there. For us here in Egypt, we uh, normally use the uh, old-fashioned way I mean we dig ourselves but uh, this equipment helps us very much because um, it saves um, time and money 
and it can tell us um, where are the urgent parts to be uh, excavated. The project is breaking new ground in different ways. Wafa represents the changing role of women in Egypt. She is the first woman ever to be given a senior position on a dig. From the shape of it, it would be um, late New Kingdom. And the uh, end of the 21st dynasty, uh, 900 BC, about. I love to get my hands in the dirt. I love to try to piece together the past. To me, that's a wonderful experience of finding two pieces that are about 10 feet, 20 feet apart, and to be able to bring them together and they fit. And that is the greatest feeling in the world. Yesterday afternoon, I came out here on one brush, my brush, I found this scarab. It's the first and only scarab I've ever found. Also this morning when I came back to draw in the exact location, we found a cobra skin right beside it. Maybe it was guarding it. Their day begins at 5 a.m. with a walk through the village to the site. The thing that uh, I really thoroughly enjoyed the most were the sounds that came every morning, the donkey and the sounds of the children. The sounds of the roosters, it was, I could hear them. I have a very visual mind and I mean an ear too and oh, it was wonderful. But the physical part of being in a culture so different than yours and a life you've never had a chance to experience. This Egypt is a beautiful country with beautiful people. In it. The nine women work and live together. The days are long but rewarding. I only say that it's been an adjustment for me, I'm, I'm old and I saw 5,000 different t tubes of toothpaste in our, in our living quarters and I haven't had a sorority life in a long time, but it was wonderful. We slept on the floor, we slept on the couches, we were really great together. They share the excitement of discovery and the feeling that they may have lived here before. And I think I lived here in past lives and I think almost anyone connected with Egypt has this feeling of an eternity, many, many lifetimes and many connections and mirrors of the past. I feel that I am still living with the ancient Egyptian and maybe because this is my study and my work. I don't know, I can't explain it, but uh, I always feel that I am with the ancient Egyptian and um, maybe I was once there. Very fine, uh, the first season of digging fabric. ends in success. Uh, they discover structural walls and 39 pottery vessels from the second century BC. Thank you. Great. There's such a romance about the ancient Egyptians. They were probably the highest culture on earth at one time for thousands of years. I think that's what is so intriguing about it, that still the monuments are standing and they're a testament in stone and they'll be here long after we've gone. They were built to last for eternity. Phase one of the project is over for these nine women, but their journey into the past has just begun. They will return to the Temple of Karnak, just as the ancient pharaohs believed they would 4,000 years ago. Next, Yoko Ono, her life after John. Yoko Ono, her name reminds us of the history of our times. It was said that she'd broken up the Beatles by getting John Lennon to turn his back on the greatest pop music group of all time. She was scorned for this, but there was also public fascination with a woman that John Lennon had loved. Woman. Understand. John's death really changed my life a lot. It was an incredible shock, of course. One doesn't expect something like that to happen in your life. You hear about other people getting into a situation like that, but you don't think that it's going to happen to you. Well, we always say that, but that's what happened to me, you see. And uh, John and I felt that we were doing everything quite right and together. We 
kept on saying peace and love, peace and love, you know. For a while, I kept asking myself, what did we do wrong? What happened? This individual, uh, Mr. Chapman, came up behind him and called to him, Mr. Lennon, as he arrived at that doorway. And then in a combat stance, shot John Lennon. Why, you know? And I still don't know the answer, really, to that one. I mean, a specific answer to that. But it certainly is a, a very humbling experience in a sense that one has to learn that there are things that happen to you anyway. Yoko Ono first established herself as a performance artist in the late 1950s in Manhattan. One of her most famous pieces is entitled Cut Piece. Viewers are invited to snip off pieces of the artist's clothes on stage. I'm a person who needs to express myself. It was through her art that Yoko Ono first met John Lennon at a London gallery in 1966. I just thought that it's nice for people to step off a painting and sort of make their natural mark. No respect for art, eh? <laughs> so I thought, oh, this is another person who thinks like me, you know, in that sense. In Yoko Ono, John Lennon found a source of inspiration. He said Yoko gave him the freedom to be himself. Together, they became partners in life, and their art and music touched our lives. In memory of John Lennon, Yoko Ono recently created an international garden of peace, Strawberry Fields. I saw people walk in there and look at the imagined circle and put flowers around it, and I thought, Oh, yes, we did change the negative vibes finally into a positive one. To the people of the world, you are my family. This is your garden. It is a gift from John to you. And I see John smiling in the sky again. My first responsibility and my love is for Sean. He's giving me a very big energy for me to go on. And without him, I think that my mind would have been uh, half of it in the past, just living there. Uh, but somehow with him, I had to go forward. At one point, I felt very guilty that I had Sean, because when John died, it was such an incredible shock for him. And I thought, well, what did we do to him, you know? And I kept saying, well, I'm sorry, I didn't know that this was going to happen, and I hope you're right, and maybe I feel sometimes guilty that I had you. And he said, what are you talking about, Mommy? I'm very glad you had me. I'm happy about it. Star piece is actually something that I thought of because of what Sean said once. He said, oh, this world is a terrible world. It's horrible, you know. And I was trying to explain to him, well, it's not that bad, you know. It can be very good and all that, you know. And I thought, wait a minute, it sounds so hypocritical. Yes, it is terrible, and we're not doing anything about it. So as a mother, I still have to do something for him and for his generation. And that's what I suddenly realized. And I thought, well, let's come out again. <laughs> Saying peace. Changing the negative into a positive, Yoko Ono is again saying peace with her album Star Peace. Yoko is presently on a concert tour of 33 cities around the world promoting world peace. Life is not only an experience, but it seems like it's a lesson. And whatever lesson that I have to learn, it seems like it's giving it to me. Life fits whatever you have to learn. Coming up, one woman's mission. Jehan Sadat fights for women and peace. And now, Jacqueline Bissett pays a special tribute to two women of intrigue. Both have triumphed over personal tragedy to become an inspiration to men and women the world over. At the age of 14, 
Simone Weil was sent to Auschwitz. Of her family, only she and one sister survived. Simone Weil's life since then has been a triumph of achievement. She returned to France after the war, married and had three children, while studying to become a lawyer. At a time when doors didn't open easily for women, Simone Weil paved the way. After a brilliant legal career, she rose through the ranks of government and was appointed Minister of Health. In 1979, she was nominated to the position of President of the European Parliament. Women have to face the fact they must work harder than men because they have all the responsibilities of being a woman on top of their jobs. It means accepting not humiliation, but the difficulties of not having support. Women must fight for respect, acceptance and equality. Her husband said to her, you have to do your duty and face everything. Jehan Sadat, wife of Egyptian President Anwar Sadat, lived by her husband's words. Together they fought to bring Egypt into a new era. They wanted peace for the Middle East. And Jehan made it her personal crusade to liberate Egyptian women from oppressive laws. Opposition was fierce. In the end, it cost Anwar Sadat his life. And the new laws Mrs. Sadat had fought so hard for were repealed. But Mrs. Sadat remains steadfast in her beliefs. She's faced tragedy with dignity and grace and has inspired women the world over. Today is the most exciting period in the history of women. The ability for women to pursue their ambitions has always been a goal. The opportunities to realize them are opening up with each passing day. I hope that through my own personal experiences and that of other women on this program, women and men around the world will more easily accept and meet the challenges of change, the full realization and expression of potential. To change for the better, not only yourself, but for the world we all share together. We're one half of the human race. We help explore new frontiers, and still we try to fulfill the traditional roles. In a time of change for all of us, Women of the World is a unique series of programs about women the world over, for helping shape that change. We do hope you'll join us to share their lives. The new Pontiac Grand Am SC, sedan or coupe, it's one of America's most exciting road cars. Grand Am SE, only from Pontiac. Women of the World, brought to you in part by the Olay family of skincare products. Future Women of the World specials. 
a model, a novelist, a princess, a pastor, a musician, an actress, a surgeon, a dancer, a legend, a soldier, an equestrian, an executive. It never occurred to me that my life would be different if I'd been a man. They are all women of the world. Join us as we cross borders and boundaries, continents and oceans, meeting more fascinating women of the world.